American gunslingers and outlaws are the folk heroes of the Wild West. We have heard stories of famous outlaws such as Billy the Kid, Butch Cassidy, and the Sundance Kid. We know the lawmen who match them not only in fame, but in skill with a firearm. But for this episode, we'll be covering gunslingers that are not stars of Hollywood movies or Netflix series. Today, we'll be discussing five gunslingers you've never heard of. Hello everyone, welcome to Chronicles of Time. If you like what we're doing here, leave a like, a comment, and please subscribe. It really does help the channel. Thank you to our amazing comment section for almost all of these gunslingers. Hank Vaughn. Hank Vaughn, also known as Henry Clay Vaughn, was an infamous gunslinger and outlaw based out of the Oregon Territory during the height of the Wild West time period. Hank got his criminal start early in life. At age 15, he had shot a man who refused to pay for a horse. While on bail, Hank shot the man who filed the original complaint. Hank's family begged the judge to show mercy to their young son. The judge agreed, and he sent Hank to the army instead of prison. However, Hank was discharged after only 45 days. By the age of 18, Hank, along with a man named Dan Burns, had rustled some horses for the Umatilla Native Americans. This tribe was historically located in the north-central part of Oregon. Sheriff Frank Maddock and his deputy O.J. Hart quickly pursued Hank and Dan Burns. The lawmen snuck up on the outlaws during the early hours of the morning, and a gunfight ensued. Both Dan Burns and deputy O.J. Hart were killed in the gunfight. Hank Vaughn and Sheriff Maddock were wounded, but they did live. Hank Vaughn escaped for the time being, but was caught and given a life sentence in the new territorial prison of Salem. Hank Vaughn's story does not end here. His family again began to beg for leniency, and the Oregon governor pardoned Hank Vaughn in 1870. He continued his outlaw life even after being married in 1875. He was involved in a gunfight in Arizona where Hank was shot in the head but survived. He made his way back to Oregon in 1878 and remarried, and from there he started rustling cattle with some Native Americans from the Umatilla Reservation. This caused anger to grow amongst the ranchers and vigilantes had begun to form. This led to an altercation at the Till Glazes Saloon in Prineville, Oregon. A ranch boss named Charlie Long confronted Hank Vaughn, and Vaughn offered to buy Charlie Long a round of drinks. When Long refused, a gunfight broke out and both men were shot. Miraculously, both men survived. Vaughn continued cattle rustling and got into another altercation in 1886 with a man named Bill Falwell. Hank started shooting at Bill Falwell's feet, making him dance like you see in famous movies. In retaliation, Falwell shot Vaughn in the arm. In 1893, Vaughn went to Pendleton to get his horse shod and to get a couple drinks at saloons. On his way out, his horse slipped in its gallop and crushed Hank. Hank's skull was fractured and he survived two weeks in a coma until he finally died on June 15th of 1893. Hank Vaughn's buried in an unmarked grave in Pendleton, Oregon. Jim Miller. Jim Miller, also known as Killer Miller, was an outlaw born in Van Buren, Arkansas in 1861. At just one, his family moved to Texas. Miller started his life of crime by murdering his sister's husband, a man named John Coop. Coop was found dead in his bed with a shotgun blast in 1880. It was well known that Killer Miller hated his brother-in-law, and he was soon arrested. Jim Miller was sentenced to life in prison, but his attorneys took the case 
to the Texas Court of Appeals, and the conviction was reversed on a technicality. This run-in with the law did not set Jim Miller straight. He hooked up with an outlaw gang in San Saba County, Texas, and began robbing trains, state coaches, and killing during both. Jim Miller bought into a saloon in San Saba and actually began a career as an assassin. His price varied between $150 to $2,000, and he earned a reputation for getting the job done quickly and efficiently. He was also known for assassinating targets at night with a shotgun. The wild thing about Jim Miller was his appearance. He didn't drink, he didn't curse, and didn't smoke. He was always very well dressed and known to regularly attend church. Some even called him Deacon Miller. He wasn't known as a fast draw for a gunfighter, but he would use his firearm when it suited him. Over the next few years, Miller became town marshal in Pecos, Texas, and gained a reputation for killing Mexicans, claiming that they are trying to escape. Miller then began a feud with the Pecos Sheriff, Sheriff Bud Frazier. While away on business, Sheriff Bud Frazier heard that Jim Miller had planned a shootout for when the sheriff returned. Sheriff Frazier contacted the Texas Rangers to intercept his plans, and in September of 1893, Jim Miller, along with his accomplices, were arrested for conspiring to kill Sheriff Frazier. Jim Miller did find his way out of this one. He had his henchmen track down all the witnesses and had them killed. With no witnesses, the state was forced to let them go. By 1894, the feud between Sheriff Bud Frazier and Jim Miller would come to a head. Frazier encountered Jim Miller on the street and yelled, quote, Jim, you're a cattle rustler and a murderer, and open fire. Sheriff Frazier shot Miller in the arm and emptied his pistol into Miller's chest, leaving him to die. There was something Sheriff Frazier didn't know about Jim Miller. Jim Miller wore a large black frock at all times. Underneath his frock, a metal breastplate to protect his chest from gunfire. Miller lived and Frazier moved to New Mexico after he lost his sheriff election. Miller continued his work as an assassin in the early 1900s, despite the fact that his family had become wealthy through real estate. He assassinated business rivals, attorneys, lawmen, and anyone who was on the receiving end of an assassination request. Even though Miller had been seen during these assassinations, he always found a way to stay out of jail, either through self-defense claims or by having the witnesses murdered before trial. Miller's luck ran out in 1909. He was contracted by local ranchers Jesse West and Joe Allen through a middleman named Barry Burrell. The target was a man named Gus Bobbitt in Ada, Oklahoma. Bobbitt was a cattle rancher and former deputy U.S. marshal. Gus Bobbitt was ambushed at his house after returning from town. Jim Miller shot Bobbitt in the side with a shotgun, his signature move. A 19-year-old cowhand, Oscar Peeler, was the witness to turn the men in and actually had been paid to lead the men to where Bobbitt lived. The Texas Rangers tracked the men down and extradited them to Oklahoma to stand trial. Ada residents knew Jim Miller's reputation for getting his convictions overturned and being acquitted for crimes that he committed. So, the town decided to take matters into their own hands. A group of roughly 30 to 40 members of a lynch mob broke into the jail around 2 or 3 in the morning and drug all four suspects to a stable behind the jail. Jim Miller remained stone cold as his three accomplices begged for their life. Jim Miller made a request to have his diamond ring be given to his wife and for him to wear his black hat while he was being hanged. The wishes were granted. It is reported that Jim Miller shouted, quote, let her rip, before voluntarily stepping off his box to hang. Jim Miller's body was returned to Texas, and he's buried at the Oakwood Cemetery in Fort Worth. John Wesley Hardin John Hardin 
was born in 1853 in the state of Texas and is known as one of the most notorious killers of the Texas frontier. Hardin got his criminal life started at the early age of 15 after killing an ex-slave named Mage after an altercation stemming from a wrestling match. Knowing that Union soldiers would come looking for him, Hardin's dad sent him into hiding. The authorities finally discovered his hiding place and three Union soldiers were sent to arrest him. John Hardin decided to confront his pursuers saying the following, quote, I waylaid them as I had no mercy on men whom I knew only wanted to get my body to torture and kill. It was war to the knife for me and I brought it on by opening the fight with a double barrel shotgun and ended it with a cap and ball six shooter. Thus, it was by the fall of 1868, I had killed four men and myself wounded in the arm. End quote. Hardin became a fugitive after this encounter and made his way across Texas drinking, gambling, and killing. There's also a tale about his run-in with the famous Wild Bill in Abilene, T Kansas. While on the run, an 18-year-old John Hardin, who was known as Little Arkansas in town, was in the Bull's Head Tavern for a drink. A man named Ben Thompson tried his best to get Hardin to confront Wild Bill over a dispute at Ben's saloon. Ben Thompson told Hardin, quote, He's a damn Yankee. Picks on rebels, especially Texans, to kill. John Hardin responded, If Bill needs killing, why don't you kill him yourself? This is where the story really sounds like legend. While Bill confronted Hardin for wearing guns on him in town, it violated town ordinance. While Bill ordered Hardin to hand his guns over, and Hardin surprisingly agreed. When Wild Bill went to grab the guns, which he was handed butt first, John Hardin flipped them around to where the barrel was now facing Wild Bill. Now, historians think this is an unlikely story, but I think this is what makes legends of these outlaws so fascinating. The confidence and bravado they exhibit their entire life makes this story believable. In 1872, John Hardin got involved in a Texas feud between the Sutton and Taylor families. Hardin himself decided to ally with the Taylor family, and even more death followed. While celebrating his 21st birthday in Comanche, Texas, Hardin spotted a beloved deputy sheriff named Charles Webb. Hardin asked the deputy if he was there to arrest him, which the deputy replied that he was not there for that. Hardin then invited the sheriff over for a drink, but when the deputy entered the hotel, Hardin and his accomplices opened fire and killed the deputy. This murder would not go unpunished. The governor of Texas, Richard B. Hubbard, offered a reward for Hardin's arrest. The Texas Rangers intercepted letters that Hardin was sending to family and found out that Hardin had fled to Florida after the murder of Charles Webb. In 1877, the Texas Rangers caught up to Hardin and placed him under arrest. They were only able to subdue him after Hardin's Colt 44 pistol was caught in his suspenders. Hardin was tried for the killing of Charles Webb and sentenced to 25 years in prison in the town of Huntsville, Texas. While in prison, Hardin began to study theology and wrote an autobiography, which is said to be wildly exaggerated. In 1894, Hardin was released from prison after serving 17 years of his 25-year sentence. He moved to Gonzales, Texas and passed the state bar exam and obtained his license to practice law. John Wesley would meet his end on August 19th of 1895. John Wesley Hardin had gotten into an altercation with an El Paso lawman named John Selman Jr., after the lawman arrested one of Hardin's acquaintances. John Selman's father, Constable John Selman Sr., himself a notorious gunman and former outlaw, had a heated exchange with John Wesley Hardin. That evening, Hardin was playing dice at Acme Saloon, where he said his last words, quote, four sixes to beat. Shortly after, Selman Sr. shot Hardin in the back of the head. Selman was acquitted, but later died in a shootout. 
Harden was said to have 27 confirmed kills, while he claimed to have 42 before his death. John Wesley Harden is buried in El Paso. Dallas Stoudemire. Dallas Stoudemire was born in Alabama in 1845 and was a famed lawman and gunfighter who served his early years in the Confederate Army. Dallas was discharged when officers learned that he was only 15 when he enlisted in the Army, and his huge height allowed him to pass for an older man. He was wounded multiple times during the war and is recorded to be 6 foot 4 by the end of the Civil War. After that war, Dallas went, went west and served three years with the Texas Rangers. He was known to be well-dressed and a gentleman around women, but when he drank, he was known as being extremely dangerous. His life after the Texas Rangers is undocumented until around 1878. It's believed he was living in Mexico because of his ability to speak Spanish so well. Dallas resurfaces as town marshal in New Mexico, until his brother-in-law told him that they need help in El Paso because of how lawless the town had become. They wanted a lawman that had a, quote, rough reputation. Dallas traveled to El Paso, Texas, and within three days of his arrival, he was involved in arguably the most famous gunfight in Wild West history. This dispute is named, quote, Four Dead in Five Seconds Gunfight. The gunfight was so famous that it made it to newspapers in San Francisco and New York. 75 heavily armed Mexican cowboys came looking for two younger cowboys who had been missing along with 30 cattle. They approached the county constable, Gus Krimkaw, and asked him to lead them to a possible location. Gus agreed and led them to a ranch owned by a man named Johnny Hale. There, they found the bodies of the missing cowboys and two cattle rustlers named Peeler and Stevenson were arrested after bragging about the killings. John Hale, the man who owned the ranch, and his friend George Campbell became angry that Gus Krimkaw had been the interpreter between the Mexican posse and the judge in El Paso. Later that day, the constable went into Keating's saloon and ran into George Campbell and a heavily intoxicated John Hale. An argument began, and John Hale grabbed a gun from George Campbell and shot Constable Gus. Hale took off running after realizing what he had done and ran right into Dallas Stoudemire. Dallas shot wildly, and a bullet hit an innocent Mexican bystander. When Hale peeked from behind the post he was hiding behind, Dallas Stoudemire shot him between the eyes. Seeing Hale go down, George Campbell threw his hands up and saying, quote, Gentlemen, this is not my fight. The wounded constable Krimkall disagreed and shot George Campbell in the wrist and the toe. And at the same time, Dallas Stoudemire spun around and shot Campbell in the stomach three times. When everything settled, John Hale, George Campbell, and Constable Krimkall, along with the innocent bystander, were dead. This started a feud between Stoudemire and a family called the Mannings. The Mannings were close friends to both Hale and Campbell. James Manning convinced former Deputy Marshal Bill Johnson to assassinate Dallas Stoudemire for his role in the famous gunfight. Bill Johnson agreed and got heavily intoxicated to commit the murder. Bill Johnson heard Dallas Stoudemire from his hiding place, but in his drunken stupor, tripped backward, causing his shotgun to fire into the air. Dallas saw this and shot Bill Johnson eight times, killing the man. The feud would end with a win for the Mannings. The following year, Doc Manning, James Manning, and Frank Manning confronted Dallas in a saloon to make, quote, a peace treaty. Temper started to flare after Dallas began mocking the Mannings. Guns were drawn, and James Manning came up from behind Dallas Stoudemire and shot him behind the left ear, killing him instantly. Doc Manning started to beat Dallas over the head after he was killed with his own gun. Dallas Stoudemire's body was shipped back to Columbus, Texas with all expenses paid by the Masonic Lodge. He is buried in the Allington Cemetery in Colorado County, Texas. Dallas Stoudemire is known as the man who tamed 
El Paso, Texas. Commodore Perry Owens. Commodore Perry Owens was born in Tennessee and was named after the great naval commander, Commodore Perry, who found his success over the British in the War of 1812. His family moved to Indiana, but by 13, Owens ran away from home to head west. He got his start hunting buffalo for the railroad and became an incredible shot. He was able to fire his rifle accurately from the hip and could fire pistols incredibly accurate in both hands. In 1881, at the age of 28, Owens moved to Navajo Springs, Arizona, which is present-day Holbrook. There are myths about Commodore Perry Owens and his encounters with the local Navajo. Owens allegedly killed two Navajo warriors and earned the name Iron Man. He was arrested by a U.S. Indian agent for the murder of a young Navajo boy, but Owens claimed that the boy was trying to rustle horses and was acquitted of murder by an Apache County jury. In 1886, Owens won the sheriff's office after earning support of the Apache County Stock Growers Association along with the Mormon and Mexican population living in the area. Owens was responsible for 21,177 square miles of territory. One of the newspapers said, quote, Mr. Owens is a quiet, unassuming man, strictly honorable and upright in his dealings with all men, and is immensely popular. Owens had the jail cleaned up and accounted for public funds down to the postage stamps that he used. Commodore Perry Owens is most famous for the Owens Blevins shootout. Sometimes it's called the Holbrook shootout. A man named Andy Cooper, whose real name was Blevins, he changed it because he was wanted in Texas, was accused of running a gang of horse thieves in northern Arizona. The pressure was on the sheriff to handle Andy Cooper and his gang of thieves. On September 4th of 1887, Sheriff Owens rode into town to serve a warrant for Cooper's arrest. Commodore Owens saw Andy Cooper and his brother John Blevins ride up to their house in Holbrook. Commodore Perry Owens knocked on the door and told the two that he had a warrant for Andy Cooper. Cooper refused to go, and Commodore Perry Owens shot him with his Winchester. Owens then stepped off the front porch and shot John Blevins in the shoulder. A man named Moss Roberts sprung from the house to engage Commodore, but Commodore opened fire on Moss Roberts. After 10 seconds, the 15-year-old Sam Blevins rushed out of the door with Andy Cooper's pistol in his hand before Commodore Perry shot him dead in front of the young boy's own mother. Commodore Perry Owens calmly saddled his horse and rode off. The young Sam Blevins died immediately, while Cooper and Roberts died later. John Blevins was wounded, but survived and convicted of assault with intent to murder Commodore Owens. The gunfight was not a popular one in town, and Owens did not seek re-election for sheriff after that. Commodore Perry Owens died at the age of 66 in 1919 from brain disease. It is said that he saw the ghost of the men he killed before his death. Thank you for watching Chronicles of Time. If you like what we're doing here, leave a like, a comment, and please subscribe. It really does help the channel. Thank you all again for the suggestions. Please keep them coming. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers, y'all.